Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Altman uh, has been telling us a list of uh, 10 defining features of a genre. So, <clears throat> we ended up how genres uh, uh, cater to certain expectations and Rick Altman, according to Rick Altman, um, producers, readers and critics all share the same interest in genre. Now, this is an interesting idea that uh, readers are not just readers, but also the audience we are talking about if film is considered a text. So, producers, uh, not just readers or the audience who wait for a particular kind of a movie um, to come along, but it is also the producers who are highly interested in genres. Now, can you give me some examples, what kind of genres would producers be interested in? Well, high concept cinema, yeah. are we talking about that? Get me George Clooney, Brad Pitt, Tom Cruise and you have a movie. But, yeah, if you look at the highest cinema like Oceans series, hmm, this would be a typical genre that producers would be interested in. A superhero movie, yeah, that is another genre that producers would like to have. But how many producers do you think will be very enthusi enthusiastic to finance a film like Fargo or not many or The Big Lebowski or A Serious Man or even A Single Man? Single Man, are you aware of Single Man? Colin Firth. Colin Firth yeah. and it is directed by the fashion designer Tom Ford. So it is a very fashion conscious kind of a film, but how many people would be interested in those kinds of movies? Not many producers. So, it is uh, it's not uh, impossible to have a punch drunk love, okay, we do find, we do find something like the master, we do find occasionally something like fight club or uh, a Fargo, okay, so Cohen brothers what, no country for old men. What do they do? They subvert the expectations that we have of a western. Consider both No Country for Old Men and There Will Be Blood, 2007 movies starring um, one stars Daniel De Lewis directed by Paul Thomas Anderson, one stars Javier Bardem and Tommy Lee Jones and Josh Brolin. Okay, directed by the Cohen brothers, based on a great novel, very successful novel by Com, yeah, Comic McCarthy. Now, what happens to, uh, what, what generic expectations are they fulfilling here? Tell, these are the westerns. Leaves. No, no, I am asking about, are they fulfilling the expectations? There are producers, there are audiences, there are critics, they expect something in a genre. Yeah. The hero dies and the… The hero dies, yes. the so called hero dies. Yeah. The voice of reason, the rational voice, it is quiet in that is Tommy Lee Jones. He accepts defeats, he accepts that he is tired and can get no longer go on. Okay. Even uh, the wife, uh, uh, who is the only noble character in the movie apart from the sheriff. Okay, there are not many characters in the film. Have you noticed that in No Country for Old Men, it is not populated with people. The setting is sparse and the characters are also minimum, they keep it to the minimum. Dialogue is minimalistic, so it is a very minimalistic kind of movies in many ways. But uh, the best person, human being in the movie, uh, Lou Ellen's wife, she is killed off for no reason. Okay, why does he kill her? Is he out on a revenge? He has already killed off her husband. Fate. Yeah, yeah. it is her fate to die. Okay, so, what is he then? The villain becomes the messenger of death, maybe Satan himself. Maybe he personifies a walking evil through the desert. Who knows? So, uh, uh, 
it subverts in other ways both these movies subvert the expectations of a conventional western that there is no hero there is no sanity there is no uh, affirmative consequential model anymore remember that's what we expect in a typical genre cause effect logic but these two movies defy every logic so why did critics go overboard in praising both no country for old men and there will be blood the, between these two movies they won all the academy awards in 2008 why did i mean javier bardem got for the best supporting actor day lewis won it for the best acting hmm uh, no country for old men was also the best movie that year why what makes for this kind of a phenomenal popularity among the audience as well as among the critics because they defied genres okay. and it is up to us how uh, uh, as consumers how much we want to take and after that do you uh, did you notice that there has been no conventional western yeah true grit yeah but true grit is a remake yeah. and then again remakes have their own lives okay uh, in at one level the, these movies also generated interest in the western as a genre okay so the audiences were ready 310 to yuma yes uh, so i think 310 to yuma came a little before these two movies 310 to yuma also is a remake is also a remake yes so uh, i uh, on one hand we are having remakes of very successful popular westerns or we are having completely subverting westerns so it's a very interesting after public enemies and after the town did we have any um, very popular gangster i'm talking more basically interested in the western and the gangster because they are typical hollywood products musicals and romantic comedies are common in every country but can you give me one single example of a very uh, celebrated gangster movie after johnny depp's and michael mann's public enemies there were some but i don't think they were very celebrated yes we aren't even aware of most of these films in our country i mean gangster has been a very popular genre in our country as well why do you think in india we don't have the western let me tell you we never have that had that western culture the typical western hero culture in our country although our landscape can also uh, uh, give you know an encouragement to that kind of a plot but we never had a very successful example of a western except shole we of, is often cited but then it's a curry like in the west we have the spaghetti version we have the curry western um, in the form of shole but then it's a mishmash of many things that we have already talked about the strong emotional connect that is the kind of characters that we had in shole so that made uh, uh, for its popularity that accounted for its po uh, phenomenal popularity but gangster Yes, we do have. Why do you think gangster heroes are so popular with us? They they subvert authority in exactly. Yeah. We always need a hero in our country or in any country. It's a very universal need to have a hero who subverts authority. At the same time, we comes along a musical and a family drama. Family drama is quite peculiar to um, Asian cinema. Okay, I don't think in the uh, in european cinema or in uh, in hollywood's brand of cinema we have this genre of family dramas maybe they have mellow dramas of another kind but not these joint family sagas hum saath saath hain hum aapke hain kaun the mother of all musicals and family dramas are you aware of these movies yeah dilwale dulhaniya le jayenge it's a love story but with a strong overdose of family so 
it's a family drama the boy is isn't out there just to win over the girl he has to win over the entire family yeah so we have a very strong we have our own category of musicals and family dramas but at the same time we also have gangster heroes so the hero in a in a family drama upholds traditions the hero in gangster cinema subverts traditions and what are we witnessing right now in our country mostly remakes we were just talking about himmatwala mm -hmm. himmatwala is being remade zanjeer we are having zanjeer yes uh, but we are uh, zanjeer is yet to come out and but then we have already seen a very successful bodyguard which is a remake of uh, one of our own other indian languages movie right and then we have also a uh, example of something like singham and then dabang was so phenomenally successful that it spawned of a sequel as well yeah so that uh, uh, these are uh, these are these heroes are not upholding family values at the same time they are not subverting authorities am i right what are we getting what kind of heroes are we witnessing at the moment kind of mixed mixed uh, maybe we are still a society in transition okay and we are we do have a tendency to lap up those kinds of films which are mass entertainers ready for example is it a family drama to an extent it's a musical to an extent yeah hero he subverts as well as upholds yeah so it's a mixed kind of a hero we are witnessing so he is the authority but at the same time he is unorthodox yes yeah. he is very unorthodox so we have that kind of so um, see the idea of having a corrupt cop is nothing uh, new to cinema amitabh bachchan's zanjeer was an individual against society he was a product of a certain kind of uh, socio political context amitabh bachchan's uh, deewar was a response to certain uh, kind of a political situation in india okay we also have post colonial cinema that is something you know a vast area in itself when india was um, just out of the colonial regime and then how did our cinema respond to the changing facets of society in uh, that period so that's another category in itself Rick Altman talks about John, and he says that uh, um, not much attention has been paid to John's as history. The question of genreic history has not been satisfactorily answered. If it's the case in Hollywood, then the need is more acutely felt in our country because we don't know that. Uh, how many a genres exists no one has done a very critical study of genres in our country in our cinema at the most we have these mixed masala kind of films okay, where everything is uh, mixed and uh, you know we we are served a kind of a pot puree of many genres but this is not the kind of genre bending that tarantino indulges in is something like giving the audience a dish and there some there is something for everyone so genres can never be neutral categories if it's a genre then it has to have a category otherwise you become big lebowski or you become fargo now coming to this popular category gangster cinema so we are talking about genre and gangster is a very popular genre um american gangster we had a very good example a successful example um Denzel Washington and Russell Crowe so uh, one of the most identifiable genre from hollywood cinema interestingly the gangster cinema of the genre was a precursor to the film noir historically it was influenced by two socio economic forces one is prohibition 
1919 to 1933 and the Great Depression 1929 to 34. I was just talking about once upon a time in America, it combines the two events. Okay. The heroes are a product, the gangster heroes are a product of the prohibition as well as the great depression era. And interestingly, once upon a time in America, those heroes are not Italian Americans, those Italian Americans, they, they are Jewish. Immigrants. So, the 20s and the 30s, historically speaking, the prohibition in 1919 played an important role in bringing the underworld into national prominence. We had regional or big city gangs. So, we had gangs of all kinds. I mean, if you watch Bruce Willis's Last Man Standing, again it is set in uh, during the prohibition period okay, and it is a small town. So, most of these uh, gangs, they belong to ethnic and immigrant groups, you already know what we are talking about, which took charge of the illicit liquor trade, Al Capone basically, most famously. The gangs quickly grew powerful and con they controlled first neighborhoods and then entire cities. So, they would start off small in ghettos and then soon there would be, they would be fighting rival gangs for domination. Yeah. Sometimes even the government, they had their one foot very firmly planted in all decision making, among all decision making authorities as well. Some of the leading gangsters and uh, you will find these characters very often in cinema. Al Capone, who was nicknamed Scarface and they had very in interesting names, Lucky Luciano, Legs Diamond, <laughs> Pretty Boy Floyd, who makes an appearance in Public Enemies, Baby Face Nelson. Uh, in, um, in Once Upon a Time in America, De Niro's character is called Noodles and you have Bonnie and Clyde, of course, immortalized by Warren Beatty, Machine Gun Kelly, Ma Barker's Gang, Alvin Creepy Carpus and then we had John Dillinger, who had uh, almost like uh, uh, a movie star fan following. When he was shot dead on the streets, okay, p uh, some people even uh, collected his blood, which was uh, still fresh on the pavement. He had that kind of fan following, uh, because the, as you rightly pointed out, what did he symbolize? Subversion of authority. People were sick of this government, but here he, there was someone who had risen from ashes uh, to such great heights and he died quite young. John Dillinger happens to be quite an interesting character, 1903 to 34, so he died at age 31 and he, ironically he loved gangster films and the last movie that he watched was Manhattan Melodrama starring William Powell and Clark Gable and very interestingly, the movie was co-written by Joseph Mankiewicz, who later went on, he became a big director, a hotshot director, a big time screenwriter. He directed the Oscar winning movie All About Eve, Joseph Mankiewicz. So, Manhattan melodrama in which Clark Gable plays a gangster and at the end, he sent to the electric chair and while in hiding, uh, John Dillinger decided to watch a movie and um, the FBI is tipped off and then he is shot dead right outside uh, the theater, theater is a biograph in Chicago and he was gunned down by the agents and this was the end of the crime wave of the 30s. It, it was almost like closing of an era in American history. These people collectively known as or called by the FBI as 
as public enemies, they were held responsible for highs, bank jobs, kidnappings and killings and of course, bootlegging and illicit uh, liquor dealing. So, what was the upshot of John Dillinger's killing? I mean, there were uh, gangster movies even before, but what happened once John Dillinger was shot dead? Cinema started uh, almost like deifying these people. So, they were not, gangster movies were not just uh, entertainment flicks anymore, but they became something more serious. The gangster hero became a corruptive, yes, corruptive force, yet at the same time he also symbolized a revolutionary, he became a revolutionary force, subverting, subverting the authority, popular morality, he questioned and interrogated popular morality and redefined popular culture. So, um, gangster cinema of Hollywood and the Hayes Code declaring war on crime movies, we were talking about classic Hollywood. So, they had, they had declared war on excessive sex and violence in cinema and these things became a critical influence on the course of American cinema for decades to come. The gangster heroes were glamorized by the media, sensational and juicy stories were written about these people, the public adored them most importantly. They were looked upon as in a classic American hero, almost like that lone ranger who rises from rags to riches, symbolizing the elusive American dream. America is a land of opportunities. And very interestingly, um, these reporters and journalists who chronicled their lives, the lives of these gangsters, later went on to become successful screenwriters. So, you see, they have had first hand experience with these people. Some of them had even interviewed these real life gangsters. So, therefore, that touch of uh, authenticity was almost there, was always there. So, gangsterism and gangster cinema parallels the concept of American dream. The myth is America is a democratic, classless society. The reality is there are deep social div divisions even in the American society and the gangsters or the gangster hero, they become fundamental in a socio-cultural upheaval. They are the people who can bring a revolution, a change, even someone from the slums can rise up. Uh, you look at a movie like Scarface, Tony Montana, who is he? He is an illegal immigrant to America, he does not even um, hold the green card, he kills a man to acquire his green card, remember? And then his subsequent rise to you know unimaginable wealth and success. So, the gangster hero causes a subversion of traditional values, yes. Now, major screenwriters of this period, Joseph Mankiewicz, who made Manhattan Melodrama, W. R. Burnett, screenwriter for Little Caesar and Ben Hecht, who was never interested in writing about conventional heroes and heroines, but focused generally or only about the so called anti-heroes. Hecht wrote Underworld in 1927 for Paramount Pictures, a contemporary tale of big city gangster called Bullweed. So, typical qualities of a gangster hero, we are still talking about genre, a typical genre. So, a typical gangster hero and we were, uh, Sandeep, if you would just remember, we are talking about 
describable and observable types. So, this is the quality of a gangster hero and please apply it to our Satya, our once upon a time in Mumbai hero, our company hero and our hero from Diwar. Okay? Do not think of Shah Rukh's Dawn, it is a very glamorized version, okay? very post liberalized version of gangsterism. We are talking about a typical gangster hero from our country, invariably from the proletariat class who accesses wealth by stealing, yes, he does not follow the rules, he need not follow the rules, he always takes the cro crooked path. He um, embodies the contradiction in any society. I mean, you look at a gangster hero in any society and uh, what we are told that whenever there is a discrepancy in any society, there would be the growth in uh, the underworld. I mean, uh, do you know Russia is known for uh, its uh, underworld and its mafia? Why? I mean, you would think that a country which so prides itself on its socialist and communist ideology, why would such a society have uh, discrepancy and why would such a society have, uh, uh, would witness growth of uh, this kind of culture? Actually, like that, it is only on the surface. It is only on the surface. The so called equality and so called social, uh, socialism is only on the surface. The rich in Russia are really rich, unbelievably rich. Okay, so, whenever there is a society where there is a big or huge chasm between the poor and the very rich, there is always a space for the growth of this anti hero. And this anti hero becomes uh, iconoclastic, you know, he is defying the rules, he is defining, defying the um, existing traditions and value system. Okay, therefore, he is a hero after all, however anti, however negative, but he is still a hero. An ordinary, ordinary man would root for this hero because he is one of us and not that super rich and super wealthy person. Robin Hood. Okay. It is always a take on the Robin Hood version, the Robin Hood legend. So, ideologically, yes, his death is necessary to restore the so called calm in our society. He has to die because he has broken so many rules. So, he has to die. But while he is alive, people root for him. I stand corrected. Do you have, have anything to add here? Uh. Movies like Godfather, he does not die because of his lifestyle, he dies for natural causes. Mm -hmm. like he just has a heart attack and dies. But yes. his, his sons die as a result of violence. Yes, like. his sons die as a result of that. So, early gangster films, and this is important to note, most of these films are produced by the Warner Brothers. We are discussing classic Hollywood, remember? Associated with low budget films made very popular, populistic kind of cinema, lapped up by the working class Americans. Some of the earlier films were um, uh, the, lit the Lights of New York, Little Caesar, Public Enemy, Angels with Dirty Faces, The Roaring Twenties, White Heat, and the most popular actors were Edward G. Robinson, James Cagney and Humphrey Bogart. And then later on we had Al Pacino. Al Pacino, <laughs> there was a period when he made a career out of playing the essential gangster hero. De Niro, always a gangster. I mean Al Pacino till, um, what was that movie with Johnny Depp, Donnie Brasco? Yes, he played a gangster till then, which was late 90s or so. So, what is an iconography? When we were doing 
semiotics if, uh, and we discuss seven semiotics particularly in relation to se uh, seven. So, the idea is that uh, the filmmakers employ certain tropes, certain signs, certain symbols to create an iconography. When we are talking about iconography of a star, we talked about James Dean, you know how his entire persona conveyed that kind of a youthful energy that was his iconography and his films consolidated the kinds of roles he played, they consolidated that persona. So, the, an icon is created. Yeah. So, gangster hero, iconography of a gangster movie, uh, the charismatic hero who embodies good as well as bad. Remember, a, a, an anti-hero has to be an embodiment of both these elements, good as well as bad. He cannot be an out and out negative hero, negative person, not a dark hearted villain who kills for no reason. Generally, it has the dangerous woman, okay. There is a good woman who is the love interest, mother mostly, yes, especially in our cinema. In Scarfe, sister is a very important part of the movie. And uh, if you watch earlier Scarface, even it is there even in uh, Al Pacino's Scarface, but the, uh, uh, the earlier version, Paul Muni's Scarface, the incest tone is so highlighted that he had a strong feelings of attraction towards his sister. So, sister becomes an integral feature in most of these films. There is always a mentor. Yes, there is. Okay, think of that. Okay. The glowing city streets during night time. Watch public enemies once more and you will find. Now, the cars, the clothes, the streets. Michael Mann is a master in creating these iconographies. I mean, LA is his space, LA is his city. Exactly, watch collateralism. Thank you so much. Collateral, heat. Heat is another highest gangster drama. The spaces are like the nightclubs, the streets, the bars, the restaurants, and the weaponry, of course. Say hello to my little friend. The scar face and invariably all this leading to invariably a very violent climax. It does not get more violent than Al Pacino's scar face. What is the significance of the gangster genre? If you are looking at the overall history of cinema, it brought new vigor and new kind of vitality to the films. The stories became more and more realistic and hard hitting. Characters became more colorful and varied. So, we no longer had the same goody goody hero anymore. And very interestingly, language of the streets, you know what I mean, the jargon, the slang, these things found their way in the films. Otherwise, films were very careful about the kind of, it was almost like reading a play or watching a play, that kind of language. But then, we had that kind of language finding its way in cinema. One of the earlier examples of this genre, Scarface, 1932, produced by Howard Hughes and Ho directed by Howard Hawks, starring Paul Muni, scripted by Ben Hecht, along with W. R. Burnett and John Lee Mann. We, these are the names that you should know if you are a student of film studies, you should know film history. Okay, and based on a pulp novel, this is also wise to. Tarantino so interested in pulp. Why does he call his best movie Pulp Fiction? He is an avid consumer of Pulp Fiction, Pulp novel, because from pulp we get so much of uh, material, okay? so, so many, <coughs> uh, so much of detailing of American culture and history and society. So, therefore, that is the importance of, so do not be dismissive of pulp. Pulp says a lot of things. It may be low art, low culture, yeah, but it gives you a slice of life. Scarface is rooted in contemporary reality with people and incidents drawn directly from Chicago gangster history. 
The other day I was telling you about how um, Howard Hughes, he did not want to release Scarface, Scarface anymore and it was released only after his death, okay, because he had to fight a long prolonged battle with the censors to release the movie. There is a dialogue in Scarface in 1932 version, where he says, there is only one thing that gets orders and gives orders and this is it and indicates his machine gun. Okay. And if you watch Al Pacino's version of this, this is exactly the, the thing he says to his boss, you giving me order, okay, watch the movie. Have you watched the movie of late? It is one of my all time favorite films. He further says, that is how I got the south side for you, you know, the boroughs in this city, Chicago and that is how I am going to get the north side for you. It is a little typewriter, you know, machine gun, a gangster is also an author. <laughs> camera is still, oh, that is camera is a pen for a filmmaker, for a writer it is typewriter, for the gangster it is his machine gun you know, punches holes in people. So, it is a typewriter. I am going to write my name all over the town with it. Now, Hayes court, which we have already done. So, the release of Scarface, this is very interesting. A movie was almost delayed by a year, because the uh, producer Howard Hughes had uh, to battle with the Hayes office and regional censor boards. Okay? And the uh, uh, films could no longer show crimes, that is the idea, that that is that is what the court prescribed uh, and the uh, exact uh, clause was that films cannot show crime in such a way as to throw sympathy with the crime as against law and justice or to inspire others with a desire for imitation. That is what people say, you know all the corruption in our society blame it on the movies, right. There is a murder somewhere people say, you see this is the influence of the movies which could be true to an extent. People watch a movie and they say, oh, you know, I learned this scene <laughs> exactly from a movie. So, um, films should not show such things, which inspire sympathy for the wrongdoer, because it creates a very bad template for the society. So, that is the idea and therefore, the producer had to fight a law. And how do they, how did they manage to release the movie, do you know? It is like, you know, cigarettes, a cigarette pack is always accompanied. Today, if you watch a movie where the characters are smoking, what do you see? A scroll running throughout that cigarette smoking causes cancer and then there is a list of ailments that you are given, not just cancer, but so many things are shown to you. The other day, I, I, other day I was watching a movie directed by Sudhir Mishra in car starring Arjun Rampal, where hero is an ex, um, is a, a media executive and he is a chain smoker. So, for the first 5 or 10 minutes, we were just treated to what happens to your lung and to your body if you smoke too much. I actually thought that I have inserted a wrong DVD, I mean perhaps, you know, I, I have, what I bought is not what I really got. And then it comes, okay, so this is all a part of the film. So, because censorship has become so strong, okay, so that is the way it is and we have to accept that. How did they uh, get away with the Scarface then? It also comes with a statutory warning, you watch that Scarface. Oliver Stone's Al Pacino, Brian De Palma version does not come with any statutory warning. Paul Muni version does come and it tells you very uh, you know, in a very moralistic tone that crime does not pay. They would not allow it to be shown in China. Yeah, but uh, do you think that if today you watch a mov movie like Scarface? Not today, no. Yeah. yeah, but in the 80s also. I mean, you had all these Rambo movies releasing at the same time. Perhaps as you see, that is the difference, you know, Rambo, in spite of his excessive violence, is a politically correct film. Yeah. What does it tell you? 
America, Rambo is an out and out and all American good guy and he is fighting the so called others, defeating the Vietnamese, the Russians, the Afghans, all the bad people of the world. Okay? And Rambo goes on a killing gun. So, I, I love the spoof. What was that hot shot? Yes, with Charlie Sheen. Yes. So, it was a very intelligently, very cleverly done spoof of the film. But Scarface, very realistic, realistically. Then, all, all, of course, you know, it had the stardom of Al Pacino looming large over the movie. So, and Al Pacino is always over the top. He is operatic in his performance. Never under, never uh, the kind of actor who would give in to any underplaying or subtleties. Okay? He is always over the top and that is part of his charm. Yeah, so, uh, perhaps you know the, the role was enacted in such a way the performance itself was so powerful. Okay. The, uh, it just overtook the message that crime does not pay. I mean who would bother with that if you could, could lead a life like Tony Montana. So, therefore, perhaps X rate, X ray, uh, what uh, the so called X rating is important for that movie. A result of this prolonged fight between the producer and the censor board was that Hollywood producers they panicked and embraced the code for self defense. And they said we will regulate ourselves. The other day we were talking about notorious and the famous kissing scene. You cannot have a kiss more than two or three seconds, but then how Hitchcock managed to. So, there is always a way around uh, you know to do certain things. Now, because the code became so strong and because the producers were so scared to make the kind of movies that they wanted to do, that they uh, just shied away from making the gangster movies. Because how do you make a gangster movie without glorifying the hero? You need to do that. You need to use certain kind of uh, language. You need to use certain kind of excesses on screen. And they were not allowed to do that. So, what did that lead to? I mean, audiences were ready for this kind of cinema. Okay, they still wanted this kind of cinema, the so called anti hero, the dangerous woman, not the goody two shoes kind of characters anymore. They wanted, so there was an audience, there was a demand. So, all this led towards film Noah. Okay. Now, Noah hero is essentially a cop, a detective, a truth seeker. So, you are using the same elements, the, a dangerous woman, a morally ambivalent hero, but he is no longer the law breaker, that is the idea. So, therefore, Noah could get away in spite of the very strict code, which the gangster hero could not get away with. So, there was a lull in all these films about gangster heroes, there was a, the rise of film Noah during the classic Hollywood times, there were certain high concept, movie, concept movies which did not do well. And then we have already talked about new Hollywood cinema at length. And now, post Vietnam, there was another wave of gangster cinema. Now, the code was no longer in existence. Bonnie and Clyde had redefined the rules of censorship, all the existing codes. So, what happened? We had films like Bonnie and Clyde, 67, you know the list, the St. Valentine's Day's Massacre, 1967, Bloody Mama, 1970, Boxcar Bertha, directed by Scorsese, good, 72, Capone, 75, and then of course, the mother of all gangster films, The Godfather. And now it has become, the genre is here to stay. So, we are talking about a very popular genre, which has become a part of all collective consciousness, the gangster hero and how <coughs> a gangster movie satisfies most of the requirements of a genre film, a highly recognized, a highly popular kind of cinema, the gangster cinema. So, from, from genre a fixed category of genre, we will move on to genre blending, the category of genre blending, where 
the semantic where the semantics and semiotics are confusing they send us mixed signals okay we were talking about the signifier and the signified and we will see how these codes which so firmly establish identities and categories in genre films okay the same codes are used to defy genres in films de deliberately seek to defy or blend genres there are certain fixed categories genres and we have seen how gangster satisfies the features of or expectations of a genre there are certain films like once upon a time in america sergio leone is which uh, redefine the category but still all the signifieds and the signifiers are in place it's just the way plot conflict and characters are developed in uh, uh, leone's movie that we find that ah uh, he is deviating from the genre but it's still the genre is there okay uh, the purity of the genre remains he experiments a lot with the way characters are sketched that's the idea but when you bend and blend genres what happens the semiotics are confusing viewers are kept guessing so you know genres are very satisfactory categories audience will know what to expect here audience don't know what to far go a pregnant cop whoever had heard of such a thing comic villains Steve Buscemi playing the kind of role he does so well, and when a filmmaker seeks to bend genre, he is subverting the established conventions and codes of an established genre. Typical examples: Terry Gilliam's Brazil, and it starts very vaguely somewhere in the twentieth century. It <coughs> blends all the items of a science fiction, a romance, a futuristic uh, kind of a film. It's a war movie. It's a dystopic movie. It's also a satire. My personal favorite is Mars Attacks. Why? Uh, it's a, a Tim Burton movie. Hmm? Mars Attacks by Tim Burton. This is one of the rare movies in which we have no Johnny Depp. okay yeah but uh, it it defies john and how okay it has jack nicholson it has pierce brosnan um, it has sarah jessica parker it has a host of big time actors okay and glen close but then you see how what he does to them and is it, it's a spoof well you can call it a spoof at the same time it's a throwback to all those so called b movies the cult movies of the 40s and the 50s it's very pulpy we know what tim burton is capable of doing so it's something like you know uh, clearing the path for someone like tarantino because we have had people like tim burton therefore we could have someone like tarantino mm, but he came much later after these people right so a man who stared at goats starring george clooney a serious man all these are standard examples so a supreme example of john bending and john blending in recent times would be tarantino's pulp fiction a much loved much watched movie now let's first talk about tarantino and why is he so important to us what are the subjects what are the themes that inform tarantino's films he is informed by the works of pulp fiction writers so you see the title itself comes he pays a homage to his favorite writers dashiell hammett raymond chandler james can raul whitfield horace mccoy so these are no high bro literateers they are out and out massy entertainers okay and pulp writers crime writers and this is important elmore leonard charles wilford other uh, important influences hong kong action films from the 80s and even the 70s 
Okay, what are, can you mention? Give me examples from some of the of some of the movies. Bruce Lee's films. Bruce Lee's, not Bruce Willis. Bruce Lee's films. Yeah, Hong Kong martial arts. Bruce Will, uh, Bruce Lee is the most well known, but there must have been several other lesser known people also. After all, Tarantino worked in a video Stop. library Stop. before Stop. making it big. So uh, that's all he did for a living. He would watch movies. Okay, and since he would watch movies, he and all kinds of movies. So. He, even the title of the res, uh, film Reservoir Dogs, it has a very interesting history. You know what? It's, uh, Someone came to borrow a, a video from his yeah. video library and uh, uh, asked for a French movie called uh, yeah, Over Les Enfants. It's a French movie. And the, and the owner who understood or spoke very little French, he said, I have no Reservoir Dogs. Okay, and Tarantino liked the exchange and it remained with him and later on he used it as a title for his very first film. That simple. So, he gets his in material and his uh, inspiration from all over the place. Okay. Another major influence on Tarantino is black exploitation cinema of the 70s. It is a sub genre, black exploitation is a sub genre or the B movies, so called B movies, action flicks, basically centered on the black people, the black citizens, uh, especially in the urban setups, settings. The highest film genre, so a cinema of Jean Melville, the French filmmaker who made a film like uh, Bob the Flamber, that was a major influence, the highest cinema. And therefore, you can see that in Reservoir Dogs. The girl gang movies and uh, Death Proof is a very good example of the girl gang kind of films. Yes, the 60s western, the spaghetti version of the western movies. The B flicks, he is not looking at the John Wayne kind of westerns, more the spaghetti and the B westerns, horror films, slasher films that is another very popular. I mean in uh, Kill Bill, he goes all the way, you know you have uh, you know, just pop taking off somebody's eye and chopping off an arm, so with so much of relish and the blood just flows, it is free flowing all over the place, gushes out like a fountain. Vigilante movies of the 70s, think of Dirty Harry. Okay, so do, you know, go ahead, make my day. And those are smart one liners, a tough street hero, vigilante films. And uh, <clears throat> most of the television programs from the 60s to the 90s. The kind of cultural references, especially references from the popular culture he makes, is astounding. And people have written books on that, how much of television he must have watched and the kind of influences that he has gathered and imbibed and I, all these things are reflected in his film. And does he have a genre? People have given his brand of cinema, its title and it is called Tarantinesque. You know, there is, <laughs> he defies genre. Do you agree? Yeah. <clears throat> so, if he makes a gangster's film, you know what he is going to do. So, salient features, what makes his cinema so special? His influences are enormous. So, uh, his film basically and if there are features, then we can categorize them. So, they, uh, so his kind of cinema basically hinges on a world of masculine codes of violence. He is immensely influenced by the masculine uh, codes of violence as seen in the movies of someone like Sam Peckinpah, who made a Straw Dogs, yeah, with Dustin Hoffman, which was recently remade. I, I guess so, and it didn't do well at all. If you watch uh, the Peckinpah version of Straw Dogs, it's so hard hitting, and also Peckinpah's Bring Me the Head of 
Alfredo Garcia and the Wild Bunch. Another recurring theme is betrayal between friends in Tarantino. Men on a mission, let's go to work. That's the tagline of Reservoir Dogs. Let's get into character. That's the tagline of Pulp Fiction. His films deal with rituals and codes of criminals. Yes. There are lengthy dialogues. It's almost like paying homage to the cinema of Godard, where people talk and talk and lovers talk in close apartments and some of the extend exchanges run into 20 minutes or so. And then in depth discussions of pop culture. So, what is Pulp Fiction? Originally, pulp was a kind of material, you know, the printed kind of literature, lowbro literature printed on cheap wood pulp paper. Successor to something called penny dreadfuls and dime novels, which you can buy for a dime or a penny, not very expensive, cheaply available, accessible. So, pulp afforded entertainment to working class people. Therefore, the word pulp, mostly an American phenomenon, featuring the Hua Polo and dealing with the lurid, sensational, titillating aspects of life. And some of the recurring themes in uh, pulp was adultery, intrigue, and then you had a street smart secretaries, mostly females, lots of murder and lots of sex. That is what you find in Tarantino's Pulp Fiction as well. So, uh, please do watch Pulp Fiction and then we will be discussing how Pulp, Pulp Fiction satisfies all the conditions of genre bending and blending. Thank you very much. <laughs>